Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining our panel discussion. Uh, I want to introduce our panelists, Catherine Paradis Terrien, Senior Manager of Analytics and Insights at TD Bank, Inmar Giovanni, Director of Engineering at Uber, Sadef Akini Kochak, Project Manager at the Vector Institute and a Senior Lecturer at Ryerson University, and Hakime Permedi, Senior Data Scientist at Ericsson for a panel discussion on addressing change, challenges, and uncertainty for women in tech. So Katrin, I will now pass it off to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so for those who don't know me, I just hosted one of the roundtable, but my name is Katrin, as, uh, as it was mentioned. And so I, I have been in the data science field for 15 years now, um, always managing a team of data scientists and I, I am also a mother of three kids. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be here and talk about the change um, and uncertainty for women in tech, because I think we all share the same challenges. And so maybe I will start with a brief introduction. Um, let's start with you and Mark. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm a director of engineering at Uber, a APG, which is um, the self-driving division for Uber. So um, my background is in machine learning. I did my PhD at the University of Toronto and have worked in uh, a bunch of places, starting from a research scientist and um, slowly moving into, well, maybe not slowly, maybe I'll talk about it later, <laughs> um, drop, getting dropped into more management and leadership. And uh, now I lead a team of research scientists and uh, research engineers um, taking the research that's done at our R&D lab and bringing it into the production system, which is the cars. And that's kind of what I uh, enjoy doing, working at the intersection between um, deep learning, machine learning, um, and uh, software engineering and production systems. Thank you. And Sede? Hi, everyone. It's great to be here this evening. Um, so I'm the project manager at the Vector Institute, where I uh, provide AI project development and management to support um, collaborations between our industry sponsors, as well as our uh, sponsors and our researchers in building and um, deploying and applying innovative AI technologies to address challenges. So um, I'm holding a PhD from Data Science and Analytics Lab at Ryerson, where I was working on Software Intensive System for Sustainability and Data Analytics. Uh, prior to joining the Vector Institute, I spent my career in building and managing data intensive R&D projects and academic industry partnerships in the, uh, in the area of AI and machine learning at uh, Southern Ontario Computing Platform um, at University of Toronto. I'm also a researcher in the area of uh, ICT for sustainability, and I'm a co-founder of Carl's Corona Alliance on sustainability design in um, software system. I'm also a part-time uh, lecturer and supervisor data science and analytics uh, program at Ryerson University since 2014. And I'm a mother of one daughter. <laughs> She's 15. Yeah. And what about you, Aki? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you all tonight. Uh, my name is Hakime, and uh, I have a background in wireless communication. My PhD was basically in electrical engineering and telecom. And uh, also my uh, experience in machine learning and AI field goes to after graduation from the school. And right now I'm at... Uh, Ericsson Gaia Center, a center for accelerator for AI approaches in next generation of wireless networks. Prior to joining to Ericsson, I was with Microsoft Research on research on reinforcement learning and text and language. And prior to that, I was I was co-founder of a startup, uh, basically. Uh, called Core Wave, working on monitoring human vital signals using uh, signal processing, machine learning, and stuff like that. Happy to be here. Yeah, so it's very nice to meet all of you. Um, so as I mentioned, let's talk about change, um, ex especially in the past six months. I think it, it has been uh, very challenging for everyone, but in general, as women, just changing from role to role is not necessarily easy. 
Um, and yeah, so I, I wanted to have you and Mar talk to us about that. Yeah, uh, for sure. Thanks for the question. So um, I graduated from my PhD nine years ago, and since then I've worked in four different places. And each time I moved for a different reason, but I think the important lesson for me was to balance um, making sure that I've given things enough time to really know if I like it or not. Um, balancing that with knowing when it's uh, it's like trusting myself and my intuition when it's telling me it's actually time to move on, right? So the first place I worked at just coming out of a PhD in machine learning was not um, in machine learning. It was as a researcher um, working on algorithms, but it was on FPGAs, which is a technology I wasn't familiar with. And um, it was just fun because mm -hmm. there weren't a lot of things to do in machine learning. Um, but I wasn't doing very well, <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> I was actually pretty terrible I think, at, the, at that particular role and um, for a variety of reasons. But um, at some point, my manager gave me some really intense feedback. And I realized that uh, there are quite a lot of things that I myself didn't really like about the job. And clearly, I wasn't doing well. And um, at the same and so I, I wasn't even a year into the job. So I thought, OK, maybe a year is the minimum. So I waited up until about the year's mark. and. At the same time, a friend of mine referred me to another place where I could be working on machine learning, and I decided to make the move. Um, and I think, you know, I've been pretty successful in my career. And I think the big lesson here is um, it is about finding a job that is right for you, because mm -hmm. like you can be really successful and you can be terrible um, if you're working on something that's not really your forte and doesn't really make you excited or, or doesn't align with what you can bring to the table. Um, so the second place I worked with, um, I was working as a researcher in machine learning. I was building models. I was having a lot of fun. And then um, because of some changes in the organization, I kind of got dropped into um, more of a manager position. And it was, um, I decided to take it because I had, you know, I had no idea what it would be like. And it was crazy for a while. Like I was really like suffering. <laughs> I had like this crazy headache that lasted for six months and I didn't know what I was doing. And um, it wasn't really sustainable. But again, I told myself, okay, try and stick it out for six months. And if you don't like it, just, you know, step back to doing what you did before and kind of enjoy it. But after six months, I actually started getting the hang of it and I understood what I liked about it. And it's still difficult, the transition from being an individual contributor where you know you're doing something tangible to managing people is, is a hard one for, for a lot of technical people. Um, but I decided to stay and I grew in this organization and I um, became um, a VP of the big data team. And at some point it felt like smooth sailing, everything was going well and this was getting boring for me. So I'm like, okay, give me more to do. Because I always want to live in a little bit of chaos and, and, and on the edge. That's just like my style. So they weren't really able to provide me with anything. And time kind of dragged on. And I and, and at some point, I'm like, OK, I don't need to. I love this organization. I love what we're doing. But I don't need to have my first, my next step here. So that's when I decided to move to another place. Um, so again, someone um, asked me to join their startup. and. Um, for me, that was OK. I want to do the startup thing. I want to see what it's like to be in a startup. And it's just like what you if you are in a startup, you know it. If not, like this is what they tell you. It's crazy. You have no like you're basically living and breathing and dreaming um, the what you're doing. And again, at some point, I, I felt like um, I was doing more than my title actually indicated. And I was you know contributing a lot. And I felt like I deserved a place at um, at a more senior um, table that I was in and I asked for it um, and and you know they kept telling me I'm not quite ready yet and, and so on which is very typical <laughs> like women hear that all the time um, and so at some point um, uh, I I was going to stick around and see what's going what what was going to happen because I was excited about the startup but I, I got this opportunity to join Uber um, from Raquel who is my boss who I greatly admire and um, I decided, you know, this is actually going to solve a lot of the problems with the startup because we didn't have enough resources, we didn't have enough people. Um, it was a big challenge from a technical perspective, and I knew that at Uber we'll get, you know, all the resources and the stuff that we need in order to actually build the product. So um, I decided to move. And interestingly, when I decided to move, you know, I, I was asking for a VP position. When I decided to move, they asked if I wanted the CTO position. So it kind of just tells you that. Um, you know, this is a challenge for women. Like I, I hear it a lot of times, which is, you know, basically 
Um, even if you dare to ask, which is already so hard for us, sometimes mm -hmm. they tell you that you're not ready and they're only willing to accept and, and admit your value when you're saying, well, okay, then I'm out of here. And suddenly, you know, the picture changes. So just an interesting lesson. Um, yeah. yeah, and and I've been at Uber now for um, for three years, and this it's been by far um, the most exciting job that I've had. Um, and I get I got to do to build the team that I wanted. Um, it's uh, it's a bit of a startup. It's a big a big corporation. Um, I work for a woman, which uh, is like a technical woman who is brilliant, which is a lot of fun. Um, we have the resources we need. We have um, we have a leadership team that's female, like in the in this org in Toronto. Um, and it's been three years. And actually, I'm also moving on, um, despite all of that. Uh, and this is actually the first time I'm saying this in public. So um, surprise! So I've decided. <laughs> yeah, I've decided that I really want to write fiction. And this is something that I never did before. And it started pretty recently. And I'm kind of obsessed with it. So. Um, yeah, if you're following me in any way, shape, or form, it's not going to be about AI anymore, but it's going to be about mm -hmm. science fiction with uh, GANs, mm -hmm. so maybe there'll be something huh? interesting for people still. Cool. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so definitely when I say change, uh, you change. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, Sadef, um, I know you're very familiar with change, too. Um, I was very impressed when you told me that you started as a chemical engineer um, and then changed your career, even with a kid, um, a daughter that was six at that time, right? So can you share your experience with us? And what's, what's your secret, you know, being able to succeed? <laughs> being a woman, hello. <laughs> oh, yeah, good one. <laughs> So, okay, um, yes, I'm a chemical engineer by education, and I used to design processes that involves data and systemic thinking, and I was actually a paper engineer and designed paper mills. And um, I did my Master of Chemical Engineering and designing uh, paper mills, and uh, I was working at the uh, paper mills and then um, suddenly that paper mill was acquired by the governmental agencies and then I found myself in working in the government. And then um, I realized that, you know, I have this like quantitative skills and like design thinking and all that stuff, but I don't know um, like how to managing people, like how to uh, like team, I know the teamwork, but the like leadership, those kind of like soft skills. So I had some, but there are, there were some room to grow. So I thought that having an MBA would be a good choice. So I did my MBA and then, uh, you know, I get these skills like communication, critical thinking, negotiation with the dynamics, because like working in the uh, government wasn't easy for me. And then on the top of that, I was a woman. I'm a woman, so it was really hard. Uh, so that government is not can Canadian government, by the way, it's a Turkish government. So I'm originally from Turkey. So um, so I, you know, uh, add all these um, competencies in order to uh, be uh, a, you know, flexible in that uh, role. But uh, one side was always saying that, like, you should go back to school uh, where you're being, like, more safe and, you know, uh, more creative. And then I moved to Canada in 2011. And then I started my PhD on environmental science. And I found that there is a niche area in software engineering and um, environmental science. And then and sustainability. And then I um, took a chance and then I uh, did my research on software engineering and sustainability. And then since our like software systems are the core system in our lives, so uh, therefore I found myself in the world of software systems. And then I realized that I can use like data mining and machine learning for developing my model into my studies. So that's how I got into the uh, machine learning and AI space. And I took a courses and read books and followed online courses in both software engineering, machine learning, algorithm, and requirement engineering. And I learned all this when I was doing my PhD. And then, although my background wasn't much related to this um, context, but I am an engineer by design. So 
my technical competencies and my transferable skills from my education and from my past experience. So they all helped me a lot when I was doing my PhD. And then I started teaching. Uh, and then I started teaching that I've learned, like I taught what I've learned. So I think that the best way that you learn something by teaching something, mm -hmm. by teaching that uh, context. So I yeah. think it, uh, it was really important. So since then I've been teaching. Um, and then I been teaching undergrad, I've been teaching graduate students, and then I also teaching the professionals who would like to change their career to uh, data, to be a data science and analytics space. So I saw a lot of, um, you know, career changes and upscaling and rescaling. So uh, including myself, because I did it um, earlier. So my key points are here is that it is not easy. So, but you have to be determined. So when you determine and then you have to analyze yourself, like what are your competencies? What are your skills and capabilities? Which ones are you strong at? Which ones are you not strong at? You need to uh, have a progress on them. And then you think about like, I think that it's really important for me was transferable skills I mentioned earlier. So. Um, think about your skills, like which ones are transferable. So how you can modify them, how you can transfer them to your new career that you can, you know, deal with those um, changes and stress. And um, another one is having a very good mentor. So to can take your guidance from. So I was really lucky that my supervisor when I was doing my PhD or my um, you know, senior management when I was uh, working. So they really pushed me a lot. So that was hard. Like when you don't realize that, oh, you're saying, oh, it is too hard. You can't do it and so on and so forth. But at the end, uh, you will see lots of benefits and you get your mentorship. And then when they push you, so then, um, you know, you find yourself in a difficult position, but you thought that you're not going to solve this, but uh when you get this mentorship and you get this um guidance then you know uh i think you can do it so this is how i manage and then the last thing that i would like to point here is that um support from your family mm. so Ooh, yeah. that was important i mean although um i moved here by myself with my daughter so my husband was in turkey for eight years uh he came back and forth like every three months we see each other but uh like i always feel his support and then you know even if we were in like virtual life <laughs> so uh he always believed in me so i think that was important and then like thanks to him and thanks to my daughter she was six at the time and i moved here but they were always supporting me. And then that I think like family support is also um, important and the team support. So like when you have in a good team in your um, company or organization, so uh, be sure that like your, you support your team and you get the same support from your team. And then like when you get the same support and then you just, you know, uh, boost your career and then, you know, when they believe in you, so then, uh, you know, it carries you into the position that it, you want it to be in. I think those are my uh, key points and takeaways during my changes. Yeah, that's such good advice. When, the, when I change role, um, without the support of my husband, it would not have been possible. You know, like I changed in March in the middle of the pandemic um, with the three kids at home. Um, and we needed to homeschooling, like become teachers at home. So he was doing so much and I was in meetings all day. So it was not possible. Uh, like it would not have been possible, but sometimes I feel that we need to ask for help, you know, because we are too proud but you just need to ask and people are happy to help, you know? So, yeah. Um, and what about you, uh, Aki? I understand that you did, your major was not in AI too. So yes. you know what change is as well? Yes, true. 
Yeah, uh, for me, the story was like I was working on a field, which is very, you know, close in terms of like the literature that we had, uh, the aspects of the technology that we were working to, to the field of AI. But I was in telecom and wireless communication. Basically, at the time I was working on 4G LTE wireless networks. Maybe you've heard it or you've read it on your phone that what is the network that you're connected to. And when I was finishing my PhD, I developed a couple of different algorithms and uh, approaches to address some challenges in networks. And it was a start of the conversations on 5G at the time. And I very soon realized that the algorithms that I have developed cannot like meet the requirements of the new generation of our networks easily. So I was looking for another approach. So I come up very soon that the solutions that usually in our field in electrical engineering we are looking for is not enough. And I realized that there is something on the other land in computer science called AI, and those are apparently a solution the time there were approaches of like scholars in in our field to tackle the problems of 5g was absolutely different a few people thinking of like maybe ai gonna be a part of the future networks but i was i deep down i believe that that's that's the key no matter if we are going to different aspects of like hardware or software ai is the key so I, I decided to take the very difficult decision to detour from electrical engineering to computer science as like my postdoc, challenge myself in, in a new field and, you know, put myself in a very high pressure of like learning and completely and absolutely new stuff, working as a postdoc and when you're like a postdoc, expectation is so high but i decided to do that i you know i was very so determined on doing that on learning that and i had a vision in my mind so after like a year i had a paper ready to publish so it means that i've learned for the very first time that when you believe in something and you do that no matter what time capacity nothing nothing can stop you you the motivation is your you know engine to go and to push so that was the first the first serious time then i decided to challenge myself in a startup ecosystem and again i put myself in you know because i, I felt that that's not the time to combine my skill sets to each other so this startup was about like using radar system coming from my phd side AI technology coming from my postdoc side, combine it to each other and try to develop the ideas in addition to management skill sets that I wanted to develop. So I started that startup, it went, but eventually like many startups, the story didn't end up to a good like, uh, you know, termination. So I had to close that startup and join Microsoft. Again, in Microsoft, it was absolutely pure computer science field, pure new field, because in my postdoc, I was working with deep learning and machine learning, and then I switched to reinforcement learning. That literature was a, a kind of like new. And when it come, came to like joining to Ericsson, which is completely the, see, for instance, when I started from end of my PhD with the idea of like, I'm going to merge AI and wireless communication to each other, I had some like diff, you know, points to meet from startup, from pure research in uh, AI. And then when it came to the Ericsson, I was exactly to the goal that I started with. I combined wireless communication aspects and AI aspects to each other. There was, there is a lot of challenges here. We are using it day to day. AI approaches to solve those challenges. But the journey, uh, I can say that this journey could be possible because I knew what is the target for me, but I was flexible enough to use different paths, not just one path. Mm -hmm. And on the other, also, I was so determined about like 
I'm going to reach this goal no matter what, nothing can stop me. And and that was that was the basic thing I was thinking about it. And I never, never feel, you know, afraid of like taking challenges, no matter what. If I'm not yeah. if I don't have like the domain knowledge, it's it's okay. I go for it, I learn it, I'll do that. So I think I think that was the key. Thank you. Um so we were supposed to finish at um, 8.45, uh, but we can continue a little bit if you don't mind. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A poll, but there is one question I wanted to ask you um, that's really important for me, was the impact that COVID had on our lives. You know, in the past um, six months, we are all working from home. Um, for someone like me, it's having the kids at home. Sometimes my daughter on me when I have a meeting, which is not super practical. Um, <laughs> but I know it could be very different uh, depending on your situation. Um, and so, Aki, do you want to share with us? Because I know you change as well. You change yes. in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. To, it happened to me to join Ericsson uh, in, on June. It was on the pandemic. I... Uh, so far, I haven't seen our office. So it happened that I haven't met my team in person. And it was a bit challenge for me. It was very stressful at the beginning. I didn't know that. Like, because basically, when you go to a new place, there, there are a lot of things you learn uh, from your colleagues, your new colleagues. There are a lot of things that you build with your new colleagues, I really believe on hallway conversations and, you know, coffee break conversations. I missed all of them. And I had to build a new relationship with new people that I have never met them in person and no office, nothing at home. On the other side, pandemic affected my life in different way. For instance, you guys had kids. So have, challenging with the kids was a big thing. For people like me that I don't have kid, I think this had another aspect that never been see, observed by other people. I didn't have any kid. I didn't have this problem. But the point is, I missed and I was confused with managing my time between the work and life. There was no kid to come and buzz me, mom, mom, I need you. And it's over. The working hour time is over. So I try to manage all this all together, more specifically with this new place. For instance, one solution I took was I started to build in relationship no, with my new colleagues, no matter what. I set up one-on-one sessions with every single member of our team, uh, our office, let's say, and talked with them, introduced myself, and tried to know them better, even out of, you know, of official meetings or professional manner, try to understand that who they are, how, what, what's the problems they, they are challenging with. If I have a question during my, this new role, who I can go and ask my question, stuff like that. I, I try to virtualize and we mimic whatever would happen in reality if I was in the office to make, bring it into my experience with this new place and try to reduce the level of this stress that a new place, new role, new topics can provide you. So this is, this is uh, the scenario that I had. Mm. And, and so what about you guys in Mar? Like, yeah, how did the pandemic affect you? I, I think you're working from home too. Yeah, yeah, I'm working from home. I also don't have uh, children. I think for me, the, um, the main challenge, and that was definitely true in the first few months, um, now things have kind of uh, relaxed a bit, is uh, everyone was suffering and everyone was suffering in their own unique way. So I'm talking about people on my team, right? It's like for some of them, yes, it was having two or three kids climbing um, all over them and not being able to work and not being able to put the time and feeling guilty about it and feeling like they're missing out and so on. For some people, it was being by themselves without community, without their friends that they can actually see and feeling very lonely. Um, so it, for some people, it was sick family members. So some people had family members who had COVID, you know, it was like all over the place in terms of the, um, how it was impacting them. Um, and 
you know, because you are the, the manager, like people come to you with all of that stuff and you kind of have to be the brave one. You have to keep, you know, um, the, um, you know, you, you have to give people direction and continue to work towards the goal that we're working towards and figure out how to accommodate the different needs um, and um, and basically keep on a brave face so that everyone feels like confident because you're you're feeling like you're showing that, you know, it's going to be OK and we're going to get through it. And um, we started doing all sorts of things that we weren't doing before, like um, right off the bed, I started doing like daily kind of just 30 minutes of socializing with the team, mm. um, which we yeah. never did before. We had like, you know, social events every once in a while and a, a weekly meeting, but this was like 30 minutes where we just like do stuff together as a team. And we started doing these like round table questions that are just, you know, icebreakers type of questions, right? And actually we learned a lot about each other and it was quite nice. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of have the temperature, you know, the, the, the beat of the team. So at some point it was not needed every day and we dropped it to like maybe three times a week. And now we're doing it like once a week, we still get together um, just for something that's completely social. So there are like all these adjustments that we made in how we interact with each other so that we, um, we get to see each other. Yeah, as you said, no more coffee, um, uh, outings, no more having lunch together. So how do we substitute that, um, that part? Um, and then just figuring out how do we keep moving when everyone has their set of difficulties, anxieties, um, and issues, uh, which is very different from normal times. Yeah. True. Yeah. And, and what about you, Sadef? So are you working from home too? Yes. Yes. Uh, I've been working from home since March. So, um, it was hard at the beginning it is hard still like at the beginning managing my time like oh my god so i was in the impression that okay i have like more time when i was working home because i don't have to commute you know i can mm -hmm. over schedule and you know i can take a lot of you know a lot of stuff and i can manage but like uh first few uh weeks i was really hectic like i couldn't manage at all and then uh, after that, I start like giving myself enough time to get things done. And then I start to like create a manageable list, uh, like weekly or like a daily, even like a very small to do list in the mornings. And I avoid um, over scheduling myself. So uh, like I learn uh, after a while and then relaxation was important for me. So um, and I put regular uh, set aside time for activities that I enjoy, for example, uh, practicing yoga in the early mornings, and it helps me a lot. Mm -hmm. And then I have a very good friend, she's a professor of software engineering, and she started a study called Rise to Flow. It's a breathing practice. It, is, it, it really helped me a lot. So it involves um, neuroplasticity practices like specific breathing exercise and to help me to deal with better with stressful situation become more like a grounded and relax if i need it so it also um give me like some tips and tricks about managing my time and like being myself and being grounded so those are like a really important so i still in that i'm still um practicing uh and then i'm still involved with that study so it really helps me a lot. Thank you so much. I just saw two questions. Uh, I think we don't have time for more. <laughs> um, so first one from Alice Lee. Um, have you came across any good tools uh, that will give you an objective assessment of your strengths? So who wants to take it? I know on the internet there's some, but I don't have a name in mind. We can probably do research and come back to you, Alice, um, if we don't have the name like that. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was in University of Alberta as a PhD student, there was a workshop there and um, they took us a test. Unfortunately, I, I, I was trying to remember the test name. Maybe Inmar in is a bit more familiar, but I'm not sure. The test was basically tried to challenge your different skill sets and categorizes people into five different basically four categories of different type of people when it comes to professional like um 
professional work and attitude. There's so the I, Briggs, is that the one? Pardon me? The Mayor's Briggs is the most famous. I think one. yes, yeah. maybe, maybe. Yeah. Anyways, but for instance, that test gave me a very interesting results. I was uh, I was in the middle of four different skill sets. I my category was like exactly in the middle. And uh, when we were doing in the workshop, the lady asked me that that who's this this one that put on the exactly middle, and I said I mean, and she said that almost one in one hundred k people will set you know put in the middle in terms of different categories and that means blah 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 so that really helped me to understand and know myself better and be able to see that okay what are the fields that i can challenge myself more so and don't be afraid of doing that so i think such a test you know personality type of test mm -hmm. that yeah. gives you better insight can be a good help yeah i remember but at the end of the road i can say yeah. uh, life life experience yeah no. i better remember one about the colors like blue was exactly like analytic, yeah. analytical yeah. and mm. i think i was in it, the middle too <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's a lot of like personality like professional assessment tests some of them are free some of them are paid um you also have to be a bit careful about putting yourself in this box and saying oh this is who i am and this is all that i can do and this is the stuff that i can't do and i agree with haki it's like experience tells you um an interesting thing if you ever get a chance to do it is what's called a 360 which is when you ask your colleagues to mm -hmm. it's basically like a structured mm -hmm. test that everyone takes about everyone else and they summarize the results and that can actually teach you interesting things not about who you think you are but how you're perceived by others and i find that yeah that one is more on like a leadership kind of um exercises they do ask your colleagues and leadership um, courses and leadership um, programs so this is uh it's like very in common in this kind of um courses and i yeah in my experience as well like uh, the experience is important your past experience or like current experiences and um you know you better so you know you have to you know list of your competencies or like a uh, weaknesses and then you uh create your own tool basically i think it's like a more important that's true okay i, I wanted to ask one more question but uh, i was told that it was the end um <laughs> it was such a pleasure to uh, to speak with all, all of you um great insights and i'm sure all the people that are here appreciated it and uh, we can connect also offline um if people have questions don't hesitate um yeah so i will let ashley close uh, now wonderful uh thank you so much that was that was fantastic thanks uh, to all i don't the... hear you i don't hmm? can, can, can you hear me now yes yes you, you can you... okay okay the usual just... technical <laughs> The technical difficulties in this work from home kind of mode that we're in. Uh, well, hopefully everybody can hear me and I just want to thank all of the panelists. Um, this is the last live session. Uh, so a huge thank to, thanks to all the speakers that we had tonight, um, as well as uh, thanks to TD Bank for sponsoring the event. Uh, recording of the keynote talks and the panel session will be available on the, uh, the event portal for the next 30 days if anyone would like to rewatch. And for the final 30 minutes of the event, there will be a one-to-one -one speed networking session to connect with more attendees. And also a TD Bank represent representatives will be available for the live forum in the TD Bank lounge if anyone has any questions for them or wants to learn more. So thank you very much to everyone and we'll head over there. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.